Hi Chem students, let's learn about the nomenclature of ionic and covalent compounds. So what we're going to need to do here is find a systematic way that we can name these compounds so that we can communicate clearly to people. It, it improves safety, it improves clarity, um, and it's, it's, it's part of the skill of becoming a chemist. You must know how to communicate and naming the compounds properly will allow you to be able to communicate. So this is part of the language of chemistry and you should learn this and make it part of your skill set and you'll never be sorry you did. What we've noticed over time though is a lot of compounds kind of appear to be composed of two parts. And that's why I've said these are pretty much binary. It's not, it's not perfectly true but for this course, for most introductory or general chemistry courses, you're going to find most of the compounds are going to come in this form. So we might see them come as a metal and a non-metal might be a metal and a polyatomic anion. So by anion, we mean a negatively charged anion, or negatively charged ion. And then by polyatomic, we, need, we mean it's a, a bunch of atoms that are bonded together, but they behave like a new thing. So we've experienced this in life. Now, a car is that way. A car is made of tires, four of them, doors, two or four of them, a trunk, a hood, an engine, a steering wheel. It's made of a whole bunch of parts, but we, we we are able to, to put those parts together and say, that's a car. And it behaves like one big thing moving down the street, even though it's made of a bunch of parts. A polyatomic anion or polyatomic cation is made of a bunch of atoms, but it behaves like one thing. We might have a polyatomic cation, which is a positively charged polyatomic, and we might have a nonmetal. We might have a polyatomic cation and anion together. And then finally, we might have two nonmetals or more than two nonmetals. So we've got lots of ways to put chemicals and put elements together to make a compound. We're going to stick with these two methodologies of ionic and covalent for now. So the most important step is identifying whether we've got an ionic or covalent compound. If you can't do this step, and it's the first step in any naming, then you're in trouble because you've got a 50-50 chance of getting it wrong at that point. Therefore, you need to identify the type of bonding and then use the proper scheme because each one of these two types of bonding has a different naming scheme, and we'll see why. So here's some kind of binary thing made of an X and a Y. X might be an ant, it might be a a cation, it might be a metal, you don't know what it is. Y might be a, an anion, it might be a polyatomic anion, we don't know. If X and Y are both nonmetals, then the bonding is covalent. Pretty simple. If X is a metal or a polyatomic cation, then our bonding is going to be ionic. And a good clue for you is if you also see Y as a polyatomic anion, most of the time, that will imply that we've got ourselves an ionic compound as well. However, we're going to sh I'm going to show you an example where that's not the case in just a second. So what I want to do is I want to show you a bunch of molecules here and see if you can identify whether it's covalent or ionic. So let's start with NaNO3. My hope is that you immediately saw the sodium Na. Know that it's a metal because it's way over on the left-hand side of the periodic table. Everything over there is a metal. Therefore, if we've got a metal, then it must be ionic bonding. How about NO2? Well, those are both nonmetals. They're over on the far right and the top of the periodic table. That makes them nonmetals. So this is going to be covalent bonding. How about SF6? Yep, sulfur, fluorine, over on the far right of the table near the top. That makes them both nonmetals. And this is covalent bonding. FeHSO4. Lots of atoms here. But I'm hoping the iron jumps out at you and you say, oh, that's a metal. Okay, and that means that the HSO4, that must be a polyatomic anion, and you need to know which anion that is. CH3OH. So you see the OH there, and you look at that very bottom other ionic clues. Why is a polyatomic anion that I put? But the OH there is not connected to a metal. It's not connected to a polyatomic cation. Therefore, this is just a whole bunch of nonmetals bonded together. And this would be covalent bonding. Uh, a nice little rule is that OH, the hydroxide, is only a hydroxide when it's bonded to a metal or a polyatomic cation. If it's in another compound and it has these nonmetals, 
like a CH3, then it's probably going to be called an alcohol, though there are some other ways that it can come about and, and show itself, and we'll talk about those as the semester goes along. So this one's going to be all covalent bonding because everything in there is a nonmetal. And here's NH4Cl. NH4 is the ammonium cation. Therefore, this has a cation. It's going to be ionic bonding. Boom. Cation, which is a, uh, and a, and a nonmetal, is going to make ionic bonding perfect for us. All right. So let's talk about how we name something. Once we've identified, once we've identified it as ionic, how do we name it? And it's a very set, a very simple set of rules. First off, write the name of whatever X is. Don't change it. If it's a metal, write the name of the metal. If it's sodium, write sodium. If it's iron, write iron. If it's a polyatomic, you just write the polyatomic. Ammonium. However, we do need to tell people which charge we're talking about. Because ionic compounds, the ratio of atoms is going to be dependent upon the charge of each ion. I'll show you that in a second. But for now, if it's a transition metal, we have an issue. Transition metals come in multiple charges. So iron is found as plus two or plus three. Copper is found naturally as plus one or plus two. So we need to be very specific with people and say, here's the ion I'm talking about. So what we do is we put the charge of the transition metal inside parentheses and write it as a Roman numeral. So you, you kind of say it as this, copper one would have a Roman numeral one in parentheses after. Copper two would have the Roman numeral two. Iron three would have the Roman numeral three. After we've written down the name of our metal or our polyatomic, we then write the stem of the nonmetal's name and add IDE. So if we've got oxygen, it becomes oxide. If we got fluorine, it becomes fluoride. If we have sulfur, it becomes sulfide. So I hope you see the trend here. If I have iodine, it becomes iodide, of course. But if it's, that's if it's an elemental form. If it's a polyatomic, we simply write its name. And that's because the polyatomics, we already know what their charge is, and we just kind of put it down there. So no better way to, to learn this than to practice a few. Um, but before we get there, we're going to need to understand why these things come in kind of odd formulas. Why is it, why is it that we have twos and threes and subscripts and stuff floating around in these compounds? And it's because we're talking about neutral compounds, compounds that don't have a charge, yet it's composed of ions which do have a charge. So the end result is the ions must be in a certain ratio so that the charge cancels out. Let's see an example. If I have something that has an X3+, plus, and we have also a Y2-, minus, whatever those charges are, then what we need to do is we need to make sure that we can cancel out the charge. Well, 3 plus and 2 minus gives us a positive 1 charge if we add that charge together. So that's not going to do the job. So the quickest way is to go ahead and cross multiply the charge. So if I multiply X by 2, I get two 3 pluses. And if I multiply the Y by 3, I'd have three 2 minuses. Both of those add up to 6 and negative 6. Put them together, you get 0. So the idea is that you'd write the formula X2, Y3 where the 2 that the x has comes from the y's charge and the 3 from the, from the x charge is what we give to the y is, is the number of atoms. It's not always so simple though because we always are going to give the smallest ratio of atoms that we can. Here's an example. x2 plus y6 minus. If we do the cross multiplying gig that we just did a second ago, we get x6, y2, x6 and y2. However, both of those, if we, we can divide both of these by 2 and get a smaller whole number ratio, we can get x3y. So that's y1. So that's what you have to do. You have to make sure you give the smallest whole ratio, ratio of whole number atoms when you write the compound for an ionic uh, substance. All right, let's practice a few. So I recommend you press pause, write down the names for the compounds that have formulas, write down the formulas for the compounds that have names, and then click play and see, what you, see if you match up what I got. All right, now that you've practiced, let's give it a try. Calcium 
And so CaCl2 becomes calcium chloride. FePO4 becomes iron 3 phosphate. Many of you probably forgot to put the 3 on there. We know it's a 3 because the phosphate's a negative 3 polyatomic ion. Its charge is negative 3. So iron, if there's only one of them, must also be positive 3 so that it's a neutral compound. Positive 3 and negative 3, add them together, you get 0. That's what we want for a charge. So that's an iron with a 3 plus charge. And that's what this Roman numeral with the with the parentheses around it is telling us is that the iron is a positive three. Ammonium hydroxide, that's NH4, ammonium, and OH4 hydroxide. They're both positive one for ammonium and negative one for hydroxide. We only need one of each. Copper two nitrate. Copper has a charge of plus two. Nitrate has a charge of negative one. I'll need two of those nitrates to make this work. Copper nitrate, CuNO3, two. And finally, Na2O is simply sodium oxide. Okay, so let's move on to naming our covalent compounds. In this case, X and Y are not ions. And since they're not ions, we can't use their charges to distinguish what the formula will be. So in, what happens is you have to actually count for people, tell them exactly how many there are of each kind. And the reason is, is because these nonmetals can make different ratios and be stable. For example, nitrogen and oxygen make a whole bunch of compounds. They make NO, they make NO2, they make N2O, they make N2O4, they make N2O5. I'm sure I've missed a few. So nitrogen and oxygen make a whole family of compounds. That's why we need to be specific and we need to tell people exactly how many of each atom are in the compound we're discussing. So, if X has no subscript, then there's just one of them. We would just write its name as it is. If X has a subscript, like N2O, that first element that's there, N2, that 2 is a subscript, we would add a prefix to tell, how many pe to tell people how many we have. And so the, sub the, the prefix for that, for 2, is di. I'm going to show you all those prefixes in a second. Then you would just write its name. Once again, don't change its name, just write it. There's nothing like we have to do for the second guy, second element, or, or Y. Um, for Y, we need to add a counting prefix, as we did before. Tell people how many there are, mono, di, tri, and so forth. But we also then have to take the stem of that element and then add the IDE, just as we did before with the ionic compounds. So here's the list of all these um, prefixes that allow us to count in w by saying a word. So 7 is hepta, 2 is di, 5 is penta. So you just need to memorize these. There's nothing else I can say other than get these down, make sure you know them, and uh, then it'll, it'll make you a better namer of compounds. So let's give these a try right here. Just press pause and see if you can try to name these and then turn it back on and we'll see how you did. Okay, so PCL3, that's a phosphorus. There's one of them, so we don't need to count that because there's only one, we don't need to count it. So we write phosphorus down, then we would write, oh, there's three chlorines, PCL3, so phosphorus trichloride, where the tri means three chlorines. N2O5, since there's two nitrogens, we need to tell how many there are. That's a dinitrogen, and then there's five oxygens, that's five penta with an oxygen oxide. So dinitrogen pentoxide. What about carbon disulfide? Well, there's one carbon according to this, and there is two sulfurs, making it CS2. Tetraphosphorus decoxide. Tetra, four. Deca is 10. So we've got four phosphoruses and 10 oxygens. P4O10. And then the last one is SF6. That's sulfur hexafluoride. So there you go. That's how you name these compounds. You need to practice to get good. It doesn't come overnight, so do it steadily because it's a big part of being a good chemist and understanding what molecules are and how they behave. You need to know how to translate these words into formula and these formula into words just as we've done here.